Thank you. So we're here this afternoon to talk about church law. Since its earliest days, the church has had rules, or if you like, church law. Rules about who was in and who was out. Rules about behaviour within the church and how to exercise discipline over those who erred. The text where two or three are gathered in Matthew's Gospel is at the end of a section about how to handle disputes in the early Christian church. Paul's letters uh, are stimulated by the controversy over what it means to be a Christian. And the writing of the Gospels, what, 30 to 60 years after the events they describe, are attempts by the church to build an orthodox faith on a common narrative. The creeds of the church were written to state definitively what the church believed, and having defined the core of that belief, to decide what to do with those who differed. How should the church try to keep order is one of the early questions. How does it keep order around its core beliefs? In there would be laws about who had the right to preach the gospel, who could celebrate the sacraments, and from the beginning the church has ordered itself by the, the perception of gifts and the discernment of vocation and the testing of call. So law has always been part of the church, even those first churches whose apostle proclaimed justification by faith. At its best, church law is gospel, just as in the Old Testament the Torah is gospel. It is an expression of what God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It describes the company, the church of Jesus Christ, and lets us know where its centre and its edges are. And it begins to help us build a sustainable Christian community on the basis of common moral behaviour, mutual accountability, and a distinctive pattern of worship and service, which would give expression to our faith. At its worst, of course, church law can be uh, obscure, it can be judgmental, it can treat the, the different, the other, rather harshly. And at that point, it in fact leads us into sin, as Paul pointed out, just as good church law can help us avoid it. So let's look at our church law as they find it in the Church of Scotland. The Scottish Reformation was the last and perhaps the most far-reaching of those reformations that swept across Europe. The fact that our foundational documents are called the first and second books of discipline probably tells you a great deal about us. We set out to work with a very simple definition of what church is. We say in our constitution the church is where the word is purely preached, the sacraments administered according to Christ's ordinance, and discipline. Discipline, that's our word is rightly exercised. Easy to say and always, always hard to define. The Church of Scotland is of course a Presbyterian church. We are governed by elders meeting in courts. Our hierarchical system of kirk session, presbytery, synod and general assembly were established with discipline in mind. The Kirk Session would oversee the moral life of the parish, the spiritual life of the parish. Presbytery would oversee Kirk Session and see that they were doing their job and test ministers whom the congregations had called. Synod, before they were abolished in the early 90s, would oversee the presbyteries. And in the end, the General Assembly itself would make the rules, set the laws and hear any appeals that were coming their way. The aim was to be an orderly church as opposed to the church that had gone before. It would be correct in doctrine and good in practice. It would give a practical expression to the faith in a rigorous sort of way. The Scottish reformers knew for certain what should be believed, how the church should be done and how life should be lived in palace and in cottage alike. The keynote of the system was that the church's authority was received from Christ and vested in courts, in groups, 
if you like, in committees and not in individuals. So, the laws of the Church of Scotland. It comes in a variety of forms as we gather ourselves together in courts and decide how our affairs should be sorted out. First, there are our constitutional items. These are the Articles Declaratory. They are part of our system, part of our rules. They're actually also part of a Westminster Act of 1921, which set the scene for the reforming, the reunion of the Church of Scotland, an act which recognised that the Church was independent from the state in terms of government, worship, doctrine and discipline. And then beside that is the internal document that formed the new church, the basis and plan of union, which in 1929 brought together the Church of Scotland and the United Free Church of Scotland in a big service held in the Annandale Street bus station. Below that set the acts of the General Assembly. You can see these on the Church of Scotland website and you'll always find the more up-to-date versions there. They fall into three categories which you can see in the screen. Legislative acts, making laws, amending acts, which change the laws, and declaratory acts, and we'll say something about each of these. Most of these legislative acts are passed at one sitting of the General Assembly, but many of them are found to be needing to be tweaked once we actually try to put them into practice in our difficult and rather complex church. And so the Assembly would then pass an amending act, which changes the original act. And when you look at the Acts of the Assembly listed on the website, you'll see Act 1, whatever it is, and you'll see behind it the Acts which changed it. And if you want to see them, you need to go back to the Blue Books for that General Assembly. <coughs> then there are things we call declaratory Acts. And this is where the Church has decided that it's time to revisit a question and state what it believes. Um, so we have a rather confusing Act recently, which looked at uh, the third article, Declaratory. So we had a declaratory act about the article declaratory um, in which we restated our commitment to be a parish church. Most laws in our church are passed at one sitting of the General Assembly, meeting in May in the Assembly Hall. But some have to come down to the presbyteries under what is called the Barrier Act. This is a recent innovation of 1697. And it claims as its purpose, the one that's there, for preventing any sudden alteration or innovation or other prejudice to the church. And so what happens is that the General Assembly receives the, the act, it debates it, and if it agrees it, then it's turned into what's called an overture. And the overture goes to presbyteries. And if the majority of presbyteries towards the end of that year pass it, then it comes back to the General Assembly and the next General Assembly can make it part of the law of the church. If the majority of presbyteries do not pass the act, then it falls and the legislation never gets on to the statute book. You need three yeses in our system to make innovative church law. The other part of church law that's not written by definition almost is the common law. Scots law has common law offences, things like theft and murder and perjury. Um, the church also has common law, things that we do because we've always done them. Um, it's interesting that when the question of women being ordained as ministers came up 50 years ago, there was in fact no law written down preventing them becoming ministers. It was just the custom, it was just the common law. And so what the church did was produce an act which said that men and women can become ministers. And of course that had to go down under the Barrier Act and be passed by a number of presbyteries and be brought back the following year. And in 20, 50 years ago, in 1967, it became one of the acts of the General Assembly and we've had women ministers ever since. Beside the acts on the website, you'll find regulations of the General Assembly. These are usually connected to acts and they have things to do with, usually with facts, figures, things that change. It's easier for us to amend these. And so you'll find things about how a man should be equipped. You'll find things about how much you can spend on your building. You'll find things about um, who can be the treasurer. These are, these are add-ons in some ways, but they keep us up to date uh, in the way we run our affairs. Deliverances of the General Assembly, these are the decisions that the General Assembly make, and these also are laws of the church. 
particularly when they urge or they instruct something. And nearly all the things we do at the moment around safeguarding, for example, are set out in deliverances. And the last bit that's important to add in here is that things that presbyteries instruct, the regional part of the church, things that they instruct are also church law. And so in our church, our orderly church, our church that was built around the idea of discipline, there is a long story uh, of us writing down what we believe, how we should work, what we should do, and what we shouldn't do. We call it church law, but it is in fact the written description of how we live together. Thank you. Thank you.